Good afternoon. My name is Rebecca Henderson, and it is my pleasure and privilege to introduce you to our panel, Business and the Environment. We have an amazing panel for you this afternoon. Two of its members have been named as among the most powerful women in the world by Forbes, and the third will soon be. <laughs> uh, so this is a, a pretty amazing group. Um, what I'm going to do is first introduce them and then talk a little bit about the structure of our time together. So let me begin by introducing Penny Pritzker. Her full biography is in your uh, handout. But uh, Penny is a graduate of Harvard College, a uh, very, very successful um, real estate industry executive. Is that the, I wanted to say real estate industry mogul, but that, that sounded <laughs> real estate industry executive. Uh, very prominent in Chicago, very active in philanthropy in Chicago, where she has a particular interest in education. Akmaral uh, Omarova is the Vice Minister for the Environment of Kazakhstan. She has flown in from Kazakhstan for this meeting. She is an HBS graduate, just two years out, so she's not yet on that Forbes list, but she will be soon, I have no doubt. Um, in Kazakhstan, natural resources account for roughly 30% of GDP, so you can imagine being Vice, President, uh, Vice Minister for the Environment is a very interesting role. And then I would like to introduce Cynthia Carroll, who was CEO of Anglo-American from 2007 to October of last year. Uh, Anglo-American, as you may know, is one of the largest uh, mining and mineral extraction companies in the world. 2012 revenue was $28 billion, and they had over 100,000 employees and operations in more than 40 countries. Anglo-Americans particularly well known for their uh, environmental track record and their leadership on environmental issues. Uh, what I'm hoping we might do is I've asked each member of the panel to uh, lead off with some reflections on their own career and how they came to be in the position they're in, and then to turn to the question of what does it mean to be a business leader faced with the kinds of environmental challenges we face? What are the opportunities inherent in grappling with those, with those challenges? And what are the challenges and issues? This is a very difficult uh, question. And all three of our panelists have thought extensively about the difficult choices and trade-offs that are inherent in, uh, in thinking about environmental issues as a business person. Uh, let me begin by asking Penny to lead off. Real estate is one of the most exciting industries insofar as the uh, thinking about environmental issues goes. So I'm delighted. Please join me in welcoming our panelists. Rebecca, thank you, and thank you for inviting me to be here today. I've been in business for uh, over 25 years with a focus, but not uh, my sole activity has been in real estate. But I'm going to focus today really on real estate. I have an MBA and a JD from uh, a school on the other coast, so I'm a little bit, uh, you know, I feel I'm in friendly territory with all of you here, but um, uh, I don't know my way around, as Rebecca knows, as she found me wandering the halls, if you will. Um, over the years, just to give you some context, I've made investments north of five or six billion dollars in real estate in, in land development, senior living, multifamily, industrial properties, um, shopping centers, office uh, properties. So I've had experience in all kinds of different real estate assets. Um, we, in terms of the environment, I had the privilege or the responsibility of developing the headquarters for Hyatt Hotels. I sit on the board of Hyatt Hotels. It's been a family business for the last 50 plus years, but today we're a publicly traded company on the New York Stock Exchange. I developed our headquarters, um, which is a building that we recently sold for north of $600 million. It's a building that Hyatt only occupies about 20% of the building, and it is LEED certified platinum. And so I've had some experience with working uh, with the LEED certification. I'm also chairman of a company called Pritzker Realty Group, chairman and CEO. Right now we're focused on developing multifamily properties, so apartment buildings around the United States, mostly on the coast. 
we've got about $560 million worth of development going on and about another $400 million in our pipeline. So we're quite active today. And then I co-founded what I believe was the first woman-owned real estate opportunity fund in the United States, and I wish I could tell you that was 25 years ago, but it was about three years ago, called Artemis Real Estate Partners. And we're located, our headquarters is in Washington, D.C. There we buy properties and redevelop them and do value-added activities. I thought the way I would structure what I would talk about is a little bit, tell you a little bit about what's happening in the hotel industry regarding the environment, and then talk about real estate in general. Because businesses, I think, are more motivated today than the real estate industry is around the environment, and I'll explain a little bit about why I think that's true. Um, the hotel industry is very focused on energy efficiency. I'm sure for those of you who stayed in your hotel last night, there was probably a note saying, if you want us to change your linens, you know, we'll change your linens, but if not, you know, either put something on the bed or on the floor or put your towels on the floor or wherever, um, all in an effort to, in essence, save uh, energy usage. Uh, what's driving that? The hotel hospitality industry uses about $3.7 billion a year in energy. So it's a big user of energy. It's quite aware of its global footprint and quite aware that its customer the person staying in a hotel cares about the environment and cares that hotel owners and operators are sensitive to the environment. So what has Hyatt done as a response to that? We've set specific measurable goals for 2015, goals to reduce our greenhouse emissions by 25 percent, to reduce our energy consumption by 25 percent, to reduce water usage by 20 percent, to reduce waste sent to landfills by 25 percent. They're pretty audacious goals if you thought about it. And we've been making progress. Our emissions use is down about 10 percent, energy 9 percent, water 7 percent, and landfill is, we're having the biggest challenge with is down about 3 percent. We have teams of people that are focused on this called green teams, and we're focused on new buildings, and we think about uh, incorporating technology and design to minimize impact, like using 100 percent recyclable carpet and different materials, or, for example, in our supply chain, thinking about the use of sustainable materials, shampoo and lotion bottles, if you will, being made of recyclable plastic, uh, key cards. All of these things are efforts that that business can do to reduce its um, either carbon footprint or use of energy. You know, sensors are used to turn air conditioning or energy usage down. But the real estate business, it's far more slow going. And I've tried to think about why is that and what are the challenges. First, there are multiple stand. First, our customer is not uniform. It's not like we have a the real estate business, we have many kinds of customers. And if you, as a build-a-suit candidate or customer, want a lead building, we'll build it for you. But if you're not willing to pay for it, we're not going to go the extra effort. And so there's both the new built environment and then there's the existing environment. One of the other challenges in the real estate business is there are multiple standards of success, as opposed to, as I described for the hotel business, they can create measurable goals, keep track of it, put teams to work on it. In the real estate business, you have LEED certification, which is what's well known here in the United States, but that ha is very expensive. And they have a different standard for an existing building from than a new built building, which is probably right, but it's, um, it's hard to know if you're complying. You try, but it's hard to know. The second is something called the National Green Building Standard. It's more affordable. It applies the same rating process for new construction and renovations. But they have different processes. So what is being green with a building? Um, and, you know, states and municipalities, and I'll get to the federal government in a, in a minute, have no uniformity of incentive to use less energy from a building. And to give you an idea, 40 percent of, of energy usage in the United States is buildings. So it is where the game is in terms of reducing energy 
um, it is a significant place to focus. So to give you an idea, 37% of housing in New York and New Jersey is multifamily housing. But they, those states only earmark 2% of their energy efficiency programs for multifamily. That's what I mean by a mismatch. So it's not, it's not coordinated, and that's a big challenge. You know, whereas Boston and Austin, Texas, assign more than 10% of their energy credits to their local multifamily. Uh, and so it makes it difficult to um, comply and difficult to know what to comply with. It's also difficult to attain value from higher environmental standards right now in a building. It's not something that the appraisal market has said, if you build a green building, that building is worth more than a non-green building. And lenders don't give you any credit for a green building. So theoretically, if you use less energy, it means your tenants could pay more in rent if the cost of occupancy is equivalent. But you don't get any credit from a lender today. So without these kind of validators of value creation, it's pretty hard for a developer just to do it out of the goodness of their heart. Um, because either your equity or your debt is going to say, no, no, I want more. So one of the things we did, I served on the President's Jobs and Competitiveness uh, Council, uh, better known as the Jobs Council, which was a couple dozen business leaders, academics, labor leaders, and elected officials um, that the President appointed a couple of years ago. We're no longer in existence. But one of the things that we focused on among many was something called the Better Buildings Initiative. And we created an initiative to focus on consumption of energy by buildings. And that's the way that the administration or any administration can use a bully pulpit to help begin change, right? And the strategy was a multiple strategy of reducing energy intensity in commercial and industrial buildings by 20% by 2020. That was our focus. And we found 110 partners, schools, hospitals, hotels, retailers, government buildings, manufacturing facilities. But we went on and got people to volunteer to strive to meet the standards. Pretty similar standards to what Hyatt's committed themselves to. And we're on track to upgrade energy efficiency of about 2 billion square feet of public and private buildings. And the other thing that we did is we secured about $4 billion worth of federal and private sector dollars to finance those investments, because that's the other problem. If you own an existing building and you want to put in a more energy efficiency me uh, mechanical systems, it's very hard to finance, because you're really financing savings, if you will. Um, Congress has also passed two programs to incentivize energy efficiency through tax reductions. Uh, and the third thing that we did was, beside policy and a, besides getting demonstrations going, is we have an ongoing effort working with the Appraisal Foundation to have energy performance considered in building appraisals. And in fact, the, the appraisal um, state regulatory agencies are now saying, requiring appraisers, if you want to become a real estate appraiser, that you have to master the topic of green buildings to become state licensed. So you realize it's, it's a multi-pronged, it's not like a company where you say, I'm going to be more responsive to the environment. To get an industry to change really requires state and local, uh, not just incentives, but more importantly, regulations, licensing, financiers involved, lenders involved. So that's one of the reasons I think our industry is a bit of a laggard in waking up to addressing what is a huge problem. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Akmara. Oh, oh absolutely. Yes, yes. Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, so I am originally from Kazakhstan, where I flew from yesterday. It's about 20 hours of flying uh, that I had to do. Um, uh, but uh, I spent, my family still lives there, and I live there now. But before that, 
you can judge by my Americanized accent, I did spend 10 years here in the U.S. Um, I first came um, at the age of 17, uh, where I uh, went on a U.S. Uh, Department of State exchange program, uh, and I lived for a year in Albuquerque, New Mexico, um, with um, in a family of a single Air Force major uh, female <coughs> who adopted four children from all wow. over the world. So I had a, a very interesting first experience in the U.S. Um, and then I went wow. on to Indiana where I uh, went to an all-female uh, college, St. Mary's College. It's a sister school of Notre Dame so in South Bend. So that's where I was for four years, also an interesting place. Um, and uh, then I spent uh, some time working here in the U.S. and also back in Kazakhstan um, in my last four years I spent with BCG, Boston Consulting Group, in Moscow and New York. And um, last year when I was kind of considering what to do with my life um, after four years in BCG and understanding that consulting is not my long-term plan, is um, I got yet another call from the Minister of Environmental Protection in Kazakhstan who is um, a Harvard Kennedy School graduate um, and a, a businessman who has gone into politics um, and he said one more time, so, are you coming or not? <laughs> um, and, I, and I thought, well, if not now, I will not do it. So let me go and do this uh, very challenging project with him. So basically, um, I am helping him to uh, transition Kazakhstan from a brown economy to a green economy. And just to give you a little bit of background of what Kazakhstan is, I realize it's not the, the place that most people know about. Uh, in fact, I was actually in this very room um, doing a project um, for uh, Michael Porter. Um, I was in his class, Microeconomics of Competitiveness, and I got four other people to do a project on Kazakhstan with me. And we started um, the, our presentation with um, an impersonation of Borat. Maybe <laughs> one, of you, one of you or some of you know, and that's, that's really the only uh, uh, reference of Kazakhstan that most people have in the Western world. But uh, we just kind of made a joke out of it. So, uh, but Kazakhstan is now, um, you know, an independent state that was part of the USSR for uh, 70 years of USSR's existence. And it was really the resource base of USSR. So Kazakhstan has all of the elements of the natural, uh, of the chemical table. I, I don't know what the name of it yeah. is. In, uh, and it's um, a top, in the top 15 uh, producers of, main commodity elements in the world. So uranium is number two, oil and gas I think is in top 10, um, and copper, iron, etc. cetera, um, also in top 15. So lots of resource extraction going on. And infrastructure and, um, and, and mindset really of still this, let's get as much as we can out of this and forget about it. Um, so, what the challenges that we're facing now when we're trying to think, you know, how do you transfer this, you know, this economy that is, as uh, uh, Rebecca said, you know, 30% of our GDP is just hydrocarbons, actually. 90% of exports are um, resources. So it's a resource-based economy. Um, and how do you change that, you know, transition this into something that's more sustainable? So the things that we are, the challenges that we're facing are first is these trade-offs between economic development and sustainable development. And what do you say to a business that says, look, you know, my infrastructure is 15 or 50 um, years old. Do you want me to refurbish it or do you want me to put a new one and you know what are the costs and how are you going to help me as a government and is this really needed you know we really need to go full force on just getting what what we have so having that conversation with the business the second one is short term versus long term impact um, and, and that's something that I know in the, in, in the Western world that's something that business is faced with, but in, in my country where I would say 80% um, of the economy is state-owned and run, um, is the short-termism of goals of the, of the government that you have to deliver against these 
um, you know, one, two, three year goals and that the government make up changes every five years. So there's no incentive to, to invest in these longer term projects that impact of which you would not see for another 10, 15 years. Mm -hmm. So how do you balance that? So that's the, the second challenge. And the third challenge is really in, a, in an emerging market where you know, the quality of healthcare and education and, and, and you know, just lifestyle in general are quite low, um, environment is not something that is on people's radars. So how do you make that, that you know, how do you make it a priority 10 out of 10 to a priority seven or five? How do you explain it and how do you um, explain to people that, look, we need to take budget out of healthcare and put it into environment? And why, do they sh why should they care about that? Um, we do have a lot of environmental disasters right there. I mean, we have one of the highest polluted environments in the world. Um, we've, we have a nuclear testing site that's a legacy from, um, you know, USSR times um, that is, you know, very, in impact is very close to Hiroshima in, in, in Japan that just nobody knows about that. Mm. Um, the third, we have a, you know, a, a lake that just dried, it's not even a lake, it's called Aral Sea. I don't know, may, maybe some, one, some of you have heard it. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge sea that just dried up because in the Soviet times, someone decided to, um, or it's not someone, Stalin actually decided that we should, um, divert the rivers into uh, for a cotton producing industry. And since that time, it's still going on the same way. I mean, the Soviet Union hasn't been around for 20 years now. Um, but you can't, what do you do with that? It's still, it's still a disaster. It's nothing has happened. So these are sort of the big things that we need to think about and, and figure out a way that we can involve the businesses, we can involve governments of surrounding countries, we can involve our own government uh, in understanding these priorities, and we can involve the society, the regular people, and uh, really educate them and, and, and make this a priority for the whole country. So that's, those are the little things I'm working on. <laughs> so. Admiral, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rebecca. It's, it's great to be here. Um, I, was, uh, I graduated in 1989 uh, from HBF, so it is a really big treat to be joining up with you. Um, my background is uh, undergraduate and a master's degree in geology. I worked in the oil and gas industry for about eight years for Amoco, doing exploration geology in the western part of the United States and then Alaska. Um, and then I, I came to HBS, spent two years, and then went off and worked for Alcan, the aluminum company of Canada. Um, I started in strategy uh, for, I was there for a short while, and then uh, managed a packaging company for about four, four years out of Kentucky. Then I was in the alumina business in Ireland. And then from there I managed global alumina bauxite and specialty chemicals. And then lastly, with Alcan, where I was for 18 years, I ran the aluminum business for five years. Um, and we became the most profitable aluminum business in the world. So I was quite pleased with that. Uh, and I was recruited to uh, become the CEO of Anglo-American. Um, as Rebecca said, in, in 2007, uh, I joined as CEO. And it was only two days ago when actually I officially <laughs> stepped down. And I'm now supposed to be continuing to work there <laughs> and handing off, but, but I'm thrilled to be here instead. <laughs> um, so what is Anglo-American? We're one of the largest mining companies in the world. Uh, we have about 150,000 employees, including contractors. Uh, we're about in about uh, 45 countries. We're very unique because we don't, um, we're largely in developing countries, so about 85-90% of our operations are in developing countries, so largely in Africa and South America. We started in 1917 in South Africa, so we've got a very 
big footprint in Southern Africa. Um, and we're, we're very unique because we are the most diversified in terms of the commodities that we produce and that we don't produce largely one or two. We're the largest producer of diamonds in the world. We own 85% of De Beers. Uh, and we're the largest producer of platinum. And, um, and that's largely out of uh, South Africa and then also have operations in, in Zimbabwe. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting company in particular, and I, I'm very proud of what we stand for and how we've developed over the years, but in the way that we think about sustainable development. And as you can all just imagine, we are mostly in rural parts of the world, in communities where there isn't electricity or there isn't running water or there aren't roads or there, there's very little education. And we're very much a part of the community. And uh, to you, the point that you're making, we think about investments and the way I think about investments is for generations to come. It's not about you know, one or two years. It's an investment usually of $5 billion or $7 billion at, at, at a given time. So we're looking at a, a copper mine development in Peru today, uh, and it will be about 5 or $6 billion ultimately. Um, so these are massive investments. Uh, they're for the very long term. In a copper mine development, it takes a good, let's say, seven years or so, 10 years even, to develop a mine. Um, and so you've got to think all the time about the footprint that you're going to leave and that the impact that you're going to have way beyond the life of mine. So I think about, again, back to generations, and that does come in such great conflict with governments that are only thinking about, you know, the next election or the next three years or whatever. Um, it's very, very difficult. And the, the, the points that... Um, have already been raised about the struggle or the, the challenges between finding the right balance is exactly what we find on a continuous basis and, and what I find is I deal with governments around the world. So to your question about what are the challenges, it really is, I mean, we have many challenges. Um, we, we lead the world in terms of HIV, AIDS, and health care in industry, not just in mining, but in industry in terms of the approach that we we take, we've got the largest testing and monitoring uh, in the world. We, t we tested about 110,000 people last year. Uh, we disperse uh, antiretroviral drugs to our employees, to their families, and to our t contractors. Uh, we also have a uh, job creation initiative that is non-mining jobs. Um, it's small and medium uh, sized enterprises uh, that are relate to our community. So in 2007, when I arrived, um, we had one office in Johannesburg. And I, at that point, asked the question, you know, why are we not in the communities where we operate where we can have a much bigger impact? So today, we've taken a model uh, that we've developed for many, many years, but we've taken it in a much broader way to South Africa and, and globally. Um, and. As I said, we had one office, one hub office to rate jobs in Johannesburg in 2007. Today we have 32 offices in South Africa and now offices around the world, and we're supporting about 65,000 jobs. So, again, that's part of sustainable development. Now, question about the environment. I mean, it is about climate change. It is about water. About 70% of our operations are in water-stressed environments. So we're always thinking about the usage of water and conservation of water. We use about 130 million cubic meters of water on, an, on an, any given point in time. That's about 43,000 Olympic-sized swimming pools of water. Uh, we use um, as much uh, energy at any given time as, as a power plant generating five gigawatts of power. Um, so it's very, very substantial. So what are we doing about this, and how do we think about it? And it comes back to the right of our communities, the right of the people that we affect to have access to water. Um, that's a priority. We set targets for all of our operations around the world uh, to uh, ensure that they're on the right track. This is way beyond regulation. <laughs> this is about what is the right thing to do, and how do we advance our position and minimize the impact on the environment 
uh, for the medium, short, medium, and long term. Um, so, so with respect to um, energy conservation and water conservation, last year we um, conserved the amount of energy equivalent to saving about $75 million. Um, we have continued to reduce the amount of water. Last year, uh, it equated to saving the amount of water in uh, two Olympic-sized swimming pools every few minutes. Um, so we're, we're, we're constantly looking at this and driving for uh, improvement and enhancement and minimizing the impact. We've got four operations today that are recycling about 90% of their water. In the last couple of weeks, I've been in Chile, I've been in South Africa, and I visited a couple operations where it's virtually everything that we're recycling. It's self-contained. Um, and we're the only uh, company in Brazil recently that we, we've developed a, uh, a nickel mine there. In the last couple of years, we spent about uh, $2 billion where we have created a community that is completely self-contained. So everything is recycled, everything. So, I mean, this is the model that we need to take forward um, globally, broadly, um, uh, into the future and sharing with our, with our uh, industry um, colleagues uh, going forward. So beyond conservation, how do you think about this? Well, today we're, we are working on a mine of 2030 uh, with the University of Queensland when we're thinking about how do you design a mine that is water neutral and carbon neutral? And, you know, I would have to say to you, we're, we're not, we're far from there today. But that's the, that's the mindset and that's the objective ultimately. We've, over the last five years, we've invested about $350 million in methane capture in Australia. And um, this is the equivalent as well of helping us reduce our carbon output by about 2.5 million tons, which is the same of taking uh, about 500,000 cars off the road at any given time. Um, so it's pretty, it's pretty significant. Um, we are making inroads. That's what I would say to you. It's not good enough, <laughs> but it does take time. And there are a lot of question marks around technologies and how you advance those technologies. And we, with other industry players, are, are working to join, join together uh, to address this. But it's, it's just early days. Um, and I guess I would just say lastly that it is about partnership. And it's about partnership with governments. It's about partnership with other industry players. It is about raising the bar and setting a standard um, and not not worrying too much about, you know, the medium-sized guy who maybe, you know, you try to help them along. Um, but it is a, it's a, it's a very, very difficult balance to strike in terms of economic development, economic attractiveness of an investment, and and advancing the environmental, you know, technologies and minimizing the environmental footprint. So. You know, that's what we're working to do in the industry. I, I guess I would say more broadly about our industry is we're hardly all there. And even some of the big players in the industry are, you know, are very, very concerned and reticent about really putting the hard numbers on the table <laughs> and making big commitments because of the shareholder pressure and because of the um, of the pressure that it will put on companies to, to take things to a different level. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I have many questions, but I'm sure that you do too. So let's go straight to, to Q&A. Yes, I'm sorry, I can't see your name card. Okay, sure. <laughs> Question to, to Cynthia, which is, what is a typical boardroom conversation uh, where you're putting forth a, a, uh, a plan or a proposal to be more environmentally uh, conscious yeah. uh, in your development? Yeah, it's, a, it's, it's a very, very good question. Um, I, I think at Anglo, you know, 
again, I'm, I'm a little biased, but I do think we lead industry. Um, I met up with a guy a couple weeks ago who is heading up a, a company that's all about, it's, it's corporate responsibility. And he said, we've done the benchmarking and you guys do, do more than anybody else. I, and I think, I think it's true, uh, but it means continuing to, to, to drive that, that forward because as soon as you kind of let your, take your foot off the, the, the accelerator on it, you know, it's easy to kind of look the other way and, and do things as we are accustomed to doing them. Um, so I would say that Anglo-American in particular is very, very proactive. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, coming back to an investment, as I said, this is an investment for, we, we run our numbers on a 30-year basis. So it's, it's, you know, that's a long chunk of time. It's got to make sense. Um, there, there are always trade-offs in what you do, uh, but... Again, the, uh, the impact that we're having on the environment, we see as our license to operate. I mean, you've got to be, you've got to be advancing your position. And, um, you know, we spent, a couple of years ago with BHP, we spent $44 million. We, we paid for the bulk of this operation on a water recycling facility in South Africa. And nobody asked us to do it. We did it because we thought it was the right thing to do. And it allows us to recycle mine water to drinking water. And it, we distribute uh, drinking water to about 80,000 people in the region, and we're doubling that. And again, the board is not sitting there saying, you know, what do you, it, why are you doing this? Or we're, just, we're simply saying it's the right thing. And we think it is about making a positive difference in people's lives and having a positive impact working with government for the long term. So it's really thinking about the generations and thinking about the much bigger picture. It's not about just the return tomorrow. Nancy? Um, I wanted to ask uh, the panel about uh, the trade-off between um, that, that you mentioned, Cynthia, about economic development and environmental impact and it's such a contentious arena um, between climate change and uh, really any kind of side impact, any kind of um, air and water uh, and allegations that these things are going to be um, detrimental to the communities in which they're happening such that it's very hard to do this in the developed world. A lot of it's been exported to the emerging world. Is that, are we doing the right thing? thing as, you know, with our high standards of environmental awareness in the Western world by saying you can't do it here, but we'll turn a blind eye to what's happening in other countries. And is that in fact the situation? Because that is deep, so yeah, I'm not so sure it is. I think you probably operate even handedly across your entire portfolio. But the contention in this, in this space is 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 very high. What could I broaden your question slightly, Nancy? Because I'd be very curious, Penny, you do a lot of work in Chicago, right? And it's not only developing world that some of the environmental problems get exported to, it's neighborhoods, right? So there'll be neighborhoods where people have maybe a different color skin or a different le less education that get stuck with these questions. I'd, I'd be very curious what the panel thinks of. I, I just don't want to make it too much US versus the rest of the, the world. Penny, you want to go first? And then we'll... Yeah, what I would say is, is our Mayor Daly, our previous mayor, passed the first uh, city environmental standard, very strict environmental standard across the city. It's going to require that kind of leadership. Otherwise, you know, it, it's not going to be Anglo-American. It's not going to be Hyatt who's going to go and and be um, irresponsible to the long term because we have similar, we may not run a 30-year pro forma, but every hotel, the day you start and conceive of a hotel, it's eight years plus until that hotel is sustained, right? So you're making long-term, multi-hundred million dollar, ours may not be multi-billion dollar, but we're doing it a lot in, in smaller all over the country and all over the world. And it's your brand. I mean, the good or bad news is today, anybody with a phone can turn you in, right? They can take a picture and turn you in. So 
laws don't necessarily hold you responsible, but certainly communities can and individuals can. So the good news is, is except for those people who just don't believe in, you know, environmental impact and say it's a hoax or something, that corporate, and my observation is corporate America is waking up to this because they have to, not because they're Elon Musk in area or, or, you know, are doing the right thing because a lot of our a lot of companies didn't do the right thing for, you know, maybe 40 years ago, 30 years ago, even 20 years ago. But I believe that it takes partnership, the cities, the states, the federal government, you know, the the actors. Everybody has to, you know, work together. Um, on the other hand, there's an incredible force called the individual with a phone who, you know, if you're dumping or if you're doing something uh, that is harming the environment, and there's YouTube, and then there's amazing how those things end up in the press. So there's this yin and yang going on. It's still, you know, pressure matters, I guess is what I'm trying to say. I Um yeah, it's it's an interesting question that you know we are definitely dealing with, and we have many of the people, regular people on the street, saying, "Well, environmental protection is something that they in the West care about because they've already have everything else taken care of. Of course, they can afford to think about these things." And what are you talking about here? I mean, we don't have food to eat. We our children are not educated, and you want me to worry about you? you know, what what the metals and mining industry should do. They should give me employment. That's all I care about. So how do you change that conversation? Um, and so far, what we've started with is is really measuring the impact, as much of it as we can. And I know that measuring environmental cost is a completely different issue that's very difficult to tackle by itself. But if we can find things that can be made clear and and uh, with with that information make this a better priority for example for Kazakhstan water is a huge issue and nobody it's it's not something that is discussed but now we're making it a point of discussion that water scarcity is a, a an issue of national security Kazakhstan does not have incoming water uh, incoming rivers and by 2050, um, we've estimated that there will be a, um, about 30 billion cubic meters. And you would have to, uh, Cynthia, translate of how many Olympic uh, swimming <laughs> pools that is. But it's a lot of Olympic swimming pools of shortage of water. That, you know, if you can explain to people, if you don't do anything now, your children will have nothing to drink. And that is making, you know, making it, what is it, what's in it for me? How, what do I do and what can I do? So first is awareness and second is giving, um, every, uh, at giving tools to people, to businesses, to governments of what to do to combat that. So that's, so that's, that's one is awareness. That's one way of doing it. And, and the other, uh, the other part that we're exploring is how can we make an opportunity out of this? So how can we say, can we develop new industries based on environment protection and conservation? Can we have laws on renewable energy that make it either as profitable or more profitable to generate um, wind and uh, solar energy? Can we maybe in some ways increase penalties for um, water, you know, uh, f for not reducing uh, water consumption. What are the different ways on the government level that we can do to create opportunities or to reduce the impact? So that's kind of the other um, venue that we're we're working on. You'll have to stop me as I go Briefly. because there are a couple of uh, comments I'd like to Tiny make. Tiny question, right? Um, <laughs> first of all. I think um, I mean we need to talk yes. um, <laughs> because I, I would say that in the developing countries where we are, uh, number one, we try to reach out to the the governments and get them to work with us to set a standard. 
and, and we, we try to it, help them to get exposure to what we think is a, you know, a global standard that we all should be vying for. And we're not everybody's best friend because we do that. But yeah, certainly in South Africa, I mean, we have a lot of, I have so many conversations with uh, ministers about, you know, setting those targets and what's manageable. You know, how is this industry going to be affected if you set a target so high? Um, and, and, and how are we going to get everybody to the same place ultimately? So, so that's one point I would, I would want. And I'm sure you're in a very unique, and, and it's not unique to customs on the other. It's, you know, many countries. Um, but the ones that we've dealt with, whether it's Botswana or whether Namibia or whether South Africa or whether Zimbabwe even, uh, or in South America, you know, Peru, uh, there are seven mines today, shut projects that are shut down because of environmental legacy and anti-mining uh, uh, initiatives or NGOs. Um, and so what we did so many years ago in that case, um, we were ready to flip the switch and break ground in Peru on this copper project. And I had seen President Garcia repeatedly he kept patting me on the back saying, this is so wonderful, we're so thrilled to have you. Um, and I went to the local community and I spent time with the, uh, the local, the regional uh, president who just come into office. And we talked about making the announcement official and he said, Cynthia, I think you're making a mistake. If you do this now, I think you're gonna have an uprising and you may find yourselves in a couple of years' time having spent so many billions of dollars and stepping back. And so we decided, I thought about it, we had a little debate amongst ourselves, we decided to pause. And we spent uh, almost two years, we created what we call a dialogue table, where you bring together uh, 28 different interest groups around the table from the region and ultimately, we took it to a vote. Do you want us or not? And they did, they did uh, vote in our favor in, in, in a very big way. So we got everybody on board. But that's what it takes. And it does take as well, as you say, it's, it's federal, it's state, or it's you know, provincial, whatever. And then it's local. You've got to get everybody on board if you're going to move in the right direction. Now, I, I just need to comment on your question about developing and developed, because I think that's a really, it's a really good question. It's a very important question, particularly for the United States. When I joined Anglo, I said, what have we got in the United States? And basically the answer was, we don't have anything. I said, how can this happen? Um, as, an, as an American, we're going to look and see what we can, we can uh, identify. So you've probably heard of the Pebble Project, which is up in Alaska. It is one of uh, three of the largest copper, undeveloped copper resources in the world. It is in designated land for development uh, in Alaska. It is in a very, very remote part of Alaska. Um, and so I went early on, and I said, and we inherited a legacy of, you know, the, the, the partner just doing the exploration, that was it, and not reaching out and not trying to work with communities and government and all the rest. So, and we knew that going in, but I said, well, let's see what we can manage to do and see if this is the right kind of investment we should be making. And so I, as I went there, I said very publicly, we won't do this if this is going to conflict with salmon, subsistence salmon fishing, uh, commercial fishing uh, in this part of Alaska. And that has always been my conviction um, and commitment to Alaskans and to uh, the native people. Um, so we've spent about $150 million just on environmental baseline studies. We spent about $500 million in total in doing all sorts of pre-feasibility work. Um, it's more investment in a, in a project that's ever been made on, on the environmental side in the world ever uh, in mining. And we're still not there. Um, but what I have asked the government of the United States more than anything is just give us a fair shake. Um, this is critical to the United States. Uh, the copper resources in the United States and around the world are being depleted. 
Um, and this is a very unique resource. So let's see whether this is manageable. Let's see whether the two can coexist. Um, and so that's what we're working on. And in about a year and a half or so, the EPA decided to get involved. <laughs> and um, I met with Lisa Jackson, um, and we said, we just need, again, we need a fair shake. We need to get through the process of assessment and get into the process of application for permits. Um, and that's the way it has been in the United States. And they decided to do their own independent study. Well, I spent quite a time, a lot of time in Washington <laughs> and up in Alaska as well, just having these conversations with senators and congressmen about what's going on. And I, I was there in January. And interestingly, there's a much greater awareness and questioning about what are the resources in the United States and how do we develop them and how do we strike the right balance? I mean, exactly to your question. So I, I, what I don't want to see happen is for the EPA to do something that is unprecedented, never been done ever, ever, to shut down a project before it's even gotten to permitting. And that's what I've asked the government to just, just give us that opportunity. Um, and that's where we are right now. We'll see what happens, but I'm still I'm still a believer. We only have two more minutes, and I have been given a hard line by the administration. No, I've been given a hard line by the administration. So what I'm going to do is ask each of the panelists. They each have a minute to say whatever they would like. Uh, what what you would like this group to take away about the critical issues in business and the environment what you would recommend managers working in this area do, uh, what, don't have to touch this one, whether women have a unique role to play in this problem, which I've heard from several people, which is a little kind of over the edge, but... Uh, but. Yeah, about jobs. Is there a trade-off between... No, no, it says in the description that you're going to talk about jobs in this field. Oh, it does? <laughs> <laughs> Are there jobs in this field? Um, so I give the panelists free reign, free reign, a minute each. Cynthia, you have a minute. Closing comment. Okay. And May, did you have? A, she said she had a critical question, issue. No, you're okay. I was going to ask each uh, of you what one thing. So May was my second mate to move this forward because I heard all of you talk about partnership. These are all great, but yeah. You have well, one I push. think the one thing is is coming back to what I've already said, what you've said. It, it's about alignment, and it's about a, a partnership. It's about engagement. That's the bottom line. It's not going to work. It's not a we versus a issue. Uh, it's not, you know, we're going we're gonna to show industry, you know, what they have to do, and we're going to be on the back foot. That will not work. It, it really is about having an open dialogue, uh, being very direct about what is manageable and what's not, and, 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 and also getting industry to put pressure on one another as well. And I think that, you know, we need to do more and more on that. Um, I would say the one thing, um, and it's very much related to what uh, you're saying, is talk about what we have to do, but also talk about what we, what are the opportunities. So does this problem, environmental problem, create something that we can do that will be new. And again, for, for my country, it's really renewable energy. That seems to be the answer that we're going for because we, um, we have one of the world's highest potential in wind um, power generation. We have a lot of wind in the country. Um, uh, so what can we do to change the conversation with the, with the businesses from you have to do this to what can be the trade-offs? Can you invest in a windmill and instead we will help you out with, you know, fines on, on what's already there that, you know, is very difficult to, to change uh, now? Or what are the different ways that we can make this an opportunity? The same for, for individuals, for people. Can we um, create these exciting new industries? We, are the go as the government, we have the money right now that we can take from oil and put it into something else. Uh, 
and that we can have that conversation with the society, with you know, people and saying, look, we're doing this because A, it's good for the environment, but B, it's good for the economy. So the conversation that we're having now, what we're trying to do is involve, make this not a Ministry of Environment problem, make, or not a problem or a discussion, make it a government discussion. Put this on the table of Ministry of Economy and, um, and have them uh, be the champions of this so that what it looks like is not, you know, let's deal with our environment. It's really let's open up new industries. And, and what are all the exciting things that you can do there with the rate of innovation in the, um, you know, solar panels. The cost of a solar panel goes down by 10% each year. Um, with wind, it's already the cost of production of uh, wind generated power is about the same on a new to new basis as the coal plant. So at least for, for, uh, for the emerging markets, I don't know what it's like here, but um, so all these new and exciting things, can we put the focus there? And that's really what we are working on quite a bit is that is, is, is the realm of opportunities as opposed to a bunch of problems. And I'll be very short, but I'm going to just add a little bit about job and job training. You know, one of the issues that we it's an issue is around skills training, and it's been an area of great focus for me. And vis-a-vis -vis the environment, we are there are jobs today that are going unfilled because we do not doing the skills training that is necessary, and that's true in both industries that are uh, you know working on the environment and in other industries. And one of the things that I've been working on is. Um, uh, really the partnership between business and community college and really I believe that the supply chain of skilled labor in this country is broken. We do not do an efficient job of getting people trained and I'll give you an example that relates to energy but it's a much broader topic outside of this which is Pacific Gas and Electric is moving its grid to be much smarter grid. It is losing 50% of its workforce, its grid workforce to due to retirement. Needs to train folks. These are good jobs. These are $75,000 a year paying jobs. And, you know, there's just been a shortage of skilled labor available. And they've started working with the community colleges, uh, first one and now multiple across the state of California, uh, training, you know, workers, including veterans, to become smart grid workers. And this is a much bigger issue that deserves a whole panel on and of itself. But what I would say is, is that, you know, focusing on skilled labor and how skilled labor can help with both, um, uh, you know, uh, all the work that can go on in homes and in buildings and on the grid and in other areas to improve energy efficiency is a huge opportunity. So I'll leave it at that, something to think about. So I hope you've enjoyed this panel. If we've whetted your appetite for issues of business and the environment, let me alert you to the fact that we've launched a business and environment initiative here at the business school. In the last three years, we've written over 100 cases in this area. We teach more than 15 courses. Uh, we have many, many students interested and engaged in these problems. So it's an area that the business school is very much, uh, very much focusing on. So please feel free to follow up with me if there's any, any uh, direction in which I can be helpful. Please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>